Our first reading on this first Sunday in Advent comes from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brethren, knowing the time, that it is now the hour for us to rise from sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is past, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering and impurities, not in contention and envy, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, by reason of the confusion of the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. And he spoke to them a similitude. See the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth their fruit, you know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. It is by the predilection of Our Lady that you and I have been called to become Catholics, that you and I have been baptized and become sons and daughters of God our Father, through the predilection, the love of our Mother Mary. And it is through the love of our Blessed Mother that the Holy Ghost descends upon each one of us that we might hear the word of God as Mary did and keep it within our hearts, live it and love it. And so, as her children, let us pray for the gift of the Holy Ghost to descend upon us all this day that the truth of God may enter more deeply into our souls. And so we pray, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Man and woman have destroyed that which God wanted to be, the fruition of his greatest work. He created us with a likeness to himself with a soul that models all eternity. And what did we do? We grasped at equality with God. We have our pride. And so we grasped at equality with God, and four things happened. First, we lost that infused knowledge that allows us to see the truth and know this is the way we should act. Now we have to struggle. We have to study. We have to go to people who are studying themselves and share with us the saints. Those men and women who begin to penetrate into the mind of God and thus say, put on the mind of God. Put on the mind of Jesus Christ. And so we have what we call ignorance. Ignorance is the result of original sin. It affects the intellect. And it is ignorance today that is causing our church and our people more difficulty than anything else. 
because it is a struggle to come to know the truth that God wishes to give to us. So ignorance has to be conquered. Second, that we find out that there is a desire within our hearts. Our hearts are hardened for some reason toward one another. And these hardening of the heart means that each and every one of us, by means of the original sin of our first parents, has a difficulty in regards to our will. Our will is meant to conform to the will of God. And in conforming to the will of God, one makes motion toward one's neighbor to learn to love even the enemy who would want to kill me. I know and you know that Christ himself on the cross prayed for those who were going to destroy him and were killing him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So the second aspect that we have to take seriously is our will expressed by our heart. Our heart must be crushed by the action of humility. The action in which I humble myself before Almighty God and say, Thy will be done. I know that God's will is being done. His providence rules the world. His providence rules every moment of my life and every word that I speak. And so I humble myself and say, I of myself am nothing. Nothing. But God, who gives me these talents, God, who shares with me the understanding of what life is all about, God is the one who has given me all things. I relate all things back to Him and know that I should never, ever take myself too seriously. The third aspect of this particular action of our first parents that gave us this original sin is the irrational appetite we have. That we're always able and capable of judging the other and getting mad. Little girls fight each other. Little boys, brothers and sisters, fight each other. We have this irrational appetite that was affected by original sin that causes us to be ready to fight. Ready to get justice on our own terms. And so, ignorance has to be fought. This hardness of heart toward the will of God has to be fought. And this idea of impatience and anger toward others has to be fought. They are the results of original sin. Finally, it is the concupiscence that we have to deal with. We know that we are meant to give others life. No matter who we are, if we are priests, we are meant to give spiritual life to those who come to us for the guidance that is necessary to achieve the kingdom of heaven. The same thing for parents. Husband and wife are married for the purpose of giving children, souls, to the kingdom of heaven. And hence, each one of us, therefore, following God's will, puts that concupiscence under control. And therefore, we know that we're moving toward that image of God's love if we are taking care of these four aspects in which original sin shows itself in our lives. Now, what's it all about? It's about the fact that we're going to be judged. It's about the fact that this world is futile, that it's going to end. It's about the fact that your life and my life have certain numbers Attached, So that at this particular point, God says, that's it. Your time in this world, your testing in this world is finished. Now you will stand before me. We know that when we die, we first of all have the particular judgment. We will go before Almighty God and we will say, how did we deal with these four aspects of my life? How did I deal with ignorance? Did I just continue doing all the things that the world says? instead of becoming knowledgeable about the spiritual life and passing through the purgative life, passing through the illuminative life and grasping at the unitive life? Have I done any kind of research, any kind of study of the saints? And so we're going to be judged on this particular aspect of our life. How did you develop that intellect that I gave to you? How did you develop that heart I gave to you? 
This is called the particular judgment. Particular judgment then will give way at the end of this world to that which is the general judgment. The general judgment has three aspects that we have to understand. The first is, in the general judgment, there is appearance. This is what's going to happen. In the particular judgment, you were given a place. You were either going to be in hell, purgatory, or heaven. In the general judgment, there is no longer purgatory. It's either heaven or hell. And now we have everyone coming forth to receive their due from Almighty God. The judge of judge will be there. And those who come from hell, what do they look like? Their appearance is really ugly. They're black. They're emaciated. They're griping. They're complaining. They smell. Every sensation is negative from that area that we call hell. And yet they're coming forward and we see them. And there they are, griping, complaining, and seeing Almighty God, and they wither. They become tied up in themselves so tightly. Why? Because they see the light of God's love, and they can't stand the presence of it. It burns them more than hell itself. And the good now are coming forward. The appearance of those who have conquered the original sin syndrome in their life. They come forward and you see them bright, beautiful, illuminating. And they look only at Christ. They want to be attracted like a magnet to that love of God. They don't even worry about the darkness of the other ones. They instead focus upon God. Nothing can disturb their direction to Almighty God. And so, like the lightning that shines in our skies going from east to west, so our Lord Jesus Christ is present there as the judge. So the first thing we have to realize is there is a difference between those who come from hell and those who come from heaven. And the appearance of these individuals who are coming from heaven is like a magnificent light show. We were out last night on the river or on the lake out there and they had the lights all strewn everywhere. Ships going on that lake to see all the lights. People are attracted to the light. And so in the final judgment, all who are of God are attracted to the light determined that they want to be with the light. It's like the little baby. You come into a room and you have a little baby there. What does everybody want to see? The baby's eyes, the baby's smile, the baby, you know, reaching out to you and saying, pick me up, pick me up. And you just get excited about these little characters. That's why we have the littlest person here light the candle there to say the light is more in you than in anyone else because you have sinned less than us. We have to go through beating our breasts, right? I'm sorry I did these things. But you, littlest one, you can say, I can stop now from being all. Oh, Mad, I can stop now from being proud. I can realize the message of Jesus Christ better than anybody else. That is why our Blessed Mother would appear to the little, littlest ones, the children. And they would receive the great messages. And the great message of our time is, Consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of our Blessed Mother, and you will have peace. Do that, you proud son of a guns up there in the Vatican. Do that. And if you do that, everybody will be happy. Because you'll bring the light into the world. Ah, the judgment. So first appearance is what we have to realize. In your mind, have an image of what's going to happen in that general judgment. Either I'm going to be black and ugly, or I'm going to be light and beautiful. And I will strive in one way or another during my life, what's ever left of it, to purify my heart and soul to stand before Almighty God. Second, three witnesses are going to stand and tell each one of us what we are. The first witness 
is right there. You. Your conscience. This conscience has been with me all my life. This conscience knows everything. And that which I have confessed and I'm truly sorry for shall be wiped clean. But that which I have not confessed, that which I have held in myself and simply been judgmental of others and griping and complaining and, and just saying I'm better than anybody else, uh-uh, that's going to come out. Your conscience is going to be your first witness. The second witness is the area where you sin. The walls of this room. The walls of where individuals have taken themselves and taken upon themselves a breaking in the relationship with Almighty God. So the walls, the places we lived, the things that we did, will all come back to us. And they will be a witness. The third is our Lord Jesus Christ. He knows all. He has seen all. He knows what you have confessed and what you are sorry for. And hence, those three witnesses will be there. And we know that those witnesses are true. And after the witnesses give their testimony, then comes the sentence. The sentence is, is irrevocable. It goes for all eternity. And each and every one, whether they're in hell or heaven, will hear the sentence. And they will then go. Who will leave first? The ones who are headed to the kingdom of heaven. Because one of the aspects of hell is the pain of loss. And so now these souls that are condemned to hell, they see what they could have received if they did little things. Wore the scapular, prayed the rosary, made good genuflections, made visits to the Blessed Sacrament, humble confessions, making use of the sacraments as they ought to use the sacraments to grow in holiness. The 24 aspects, the narrow ways that lead to heaven. The seven spiritual and the seven corporal spiritual works of mercy. All of these are going to be able to lead those souls into the light of God's love. And they will go first, singing. And the rest, then they have these words. They hear them. Depart from me, you cursed. Depart from me. Into the fire that has been prepared for the devil and all those united with him. The pain of loss now turns into the pain of regret. The worm that dies not and eats away at the heart. Imagine, this is eternity. And imagine, before we have the incarnation, God says, think about the end of your life. Think about what this all happens to be about. Reflect upon it. That's the first thing we have to do. And then prepare your hearts by good, humble confessions, realizing that you have to look at your dispositions, your attitudes, rather than simply say, I get impatient. You wipe it off. No. Why am I getting impatient? Why am I not saving a soul in this action that I call a sin of impatience? Why am I not saving a soul? What is my disposition about bringing souls to the kingdom of heaven? Souls that I may not see until I stand before Almighty God in judgment. Because in judgment, all those souls that we have brought to the kingdom of heaven circle us and embrace us and love us and say, Thank you, thank you for bringing me to this kingdom. You and I are asked to look beyond just the present moment. Enter into the eternal life and love that God wants you to have and does not want the devil to deceive you. So we talk about the diabolical disorientation, but how are we battling him? How are we getting rid of this ignorance concerning the spiritual life? How are we getting rid of this hardness of heart that makes me go against my neighbor and cry about what's happening in the world? Who cares? How am I sanctifying my soul? How am I joining with others who are happy? And now we have the example of the saints. 
The example of a saint. St. Francis of Assisi. One of the marvelous things about St. Francis of Assisi was the humility of all of the brothers. There is a story told called the Congress of the Brothers. All the brothers were joined together in a place in France for a congregation communication. There they were, 5,000. Amongst them was St. Dominic. And in the first conference, St. Francis of Assisi said to all of them, Don't worry about what you're going to put on. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about anything but becoming holy. And everything else will be given to you. And Dominic, St. Dominic goes up to St. Francis and says, Aren't you going to worry about feeding these people? No. Well, that doesn't seem too prudent. And all of a sudden, St. Dominic turned around and he saw the neighboring people who have seen this great assembly of holy men said, they will need food. And wine was brought. And bread was brought. And they were all fed better than anybody. And Dominic's looking at this whole thing. He says, oh my gosh. God took care of it, didn't he? So there was a judgment there. Dominic changed his mind. He says, Lady poverty, an expression of God's love, is more important than anything else. Now, Brother Angelo came in to the Franciscan order. Brother Angelo was a good young man, happy young man. He was placed in charge, a porter of a particular house of St. Francis of Assisi. And as a porter, he gets, gathers people and he meets with people at the door. Three notorious robbers and murderers came to the door and asked for food. Brother Angelo saw them and said, What, you murderers, you robbers, you come here to the place of God and you ask for food? Why, the earth should swallow you up. And he rammed at him and he told him off. He says, Go away and don't ever come back here. They went away mad. Francis comes in and Brother Angelo tells him what he did. And he said to Brother Angelo, Brother Angelo, here, I just baked this wine, I just baked this bread. You go find those robbers. Don't you know it would be better for you to give to them cheerfully and happily that more sinners are captured by love and kindness than by ranting and raving? Don't you know that? Didn't I teach you that? Here, go find them. Well, the brother went out and found them and gave them the thing. And he knelt down before them and says, Please, give me your forgiveness. I am so sorry. That humility brought those three robbers back to the church. Now, later on, Brother Angelo had St. Francis of Assisi's death. After St. Francis died... Angelo was on a mission. And on the mission, he had to sleep on a hard pillow of a rock. He was sleeping on that hard pillow of rock when all of a sudden, an angel came. In a dream? Don't know. But the angel came and said, You come with me. Little Angelina, you come with me. And so, here he was starting to follow the angel. And it was no problem until they came to a bridge and the bridge was dilapidated. And he looked at it and he says, Look, below is nothing more than animals and fish and rocks. And we're going to fall down that way and we'll be destroyed. It looked pretty bad, didn't it? The angel said, You put your foot where I put my foot. So the angel with his wings started going across the bridge and wherever that angel touched... It was solid. And so, Brother Angelo followed right in those steps. Till he got to the middle, then the angel took his wings and flew off to a mountain. Now what is Brother Angelo going to do? 
He looked down and he grabbed down at the bottom and he says, Oh Lord, oh Lord, please help me. I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, God started growing on this brother Angelo wings. He got up and he tried to use the wings and the feathers started coming off and he fell back down. He was not waiting for the wings to develop. They have to completely develop. We have to have both penance and communion. We have to have reparation and union. We have to have both in our spiritual lives. Now, brother fell a second time, and again the wings began to grow farther. He thought, oh, now I can do it. He tried to flap his wings, and they came right back down again. Then he realized that his impatience was the problem. I have to wait till God finishes what he's doing with me. Ooh. So now he waited and the wings grew. And then he flew to where the angel was. And the angel then took him in to a chamber in which all of a sudden Brother Angelo saw St. Francis of Assisi coming to him saw all these Franciscan saints coming to him. And they were bright and beautiful. And he just enveloped himself. He says, I felt so consoled. And then Francis told him, we are sending you back to the earth. Whoa, no! Don't send me back there! You're going back. You've got seven days. Seven days to perfect yourself. To finish. And so he came back. In seven days, he learned to love everybody. He learned to do whatever. And he told them, I will not be here longer. They couldn't believe you were in good health. Seventh day came, and there he went with St. Francis of Assisi. The judgment was then. We have these saints, and we have these stories, in order that we might begin to realize that there's a symbol in each and every story. The Gospel has symbols that teach us about eternity. The first symbol is the fact that every one of us has a guardian angel. And every one of our guardian angels is responsible for bringing us back to the kingdom of God. And so what we have to do is we have to develop the two wings to be able to fly to the kingdom of heaven. The wing of penance. The wing of holy communion. Love of our Lord and the blessed sacrament. Love of our blessed mother. Love of the spiritual life. And those two wings will cause us to start going farther and farther in the spiritual life. We will not have to worry about the purgative life and attachment to sin. We won't want to hurt our Lord. We'll begin to illumine ourselves with the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. The truth, as Francis of Assisi, when he was in life, the truth came to him with Brother Reginald. They were walking up a mountain, and it was storming, raining, cold. And Francis sees Brother Reginald ahead of him. He's a better hiker. And he says, Reginald, Brother Reginald. Yes, Francis, do you know what true joy is? No. Would it be true joy if all the Franciscans in the world were gathered together and praising God? Wouldn't that be pure joy? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, brother, that's not pure joy. They kept on walking up the mountain. They're getting blasted. Lightning is going. The rain is pelting and they're wet. They're muddy. Brother, do you know what pure joy is? No, I don't. I'm cold. Brother, would it be pure joy if the Franciscans went to all the universities, got the best grades, knew all the things that they needed to know to convert the world? Would that be pure joy? Yeah. No, brother, that's not pure joy. They kept going up. And Francis three or four times asked all these things about, you know, what is pure joy? And finally got to the door. And he said, do you know what pure joy is? If this door opens up and they see you and me, dirty, wet, ugly, they tell us, get out of here. And in our hearts, we're rejoicing. We're saying, thank you, Lord. You've given me this great opportunity. You were despised. You were rejected. And now I get to be despised and rejected. 
Brother Reginald, would that be pure joy? Well, I don't know. That is pure joy. That is pure joy. To be able to be rejected and despised and yet not to have any hard feelings. The saints tell us these things. The judgment is today. How are you going to prepare yourself for the Christmas? Are you going to go out and say, I want more things? Or do I want holiness? The only thing that will matter when you go before Almighty God is how you now imitate and live the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else. So why get impatient? Why get proud? Why get any of this stuff when the most important thing is that you be despised, rejected, thrown away? That is pure joy. When you don't have a heart that sits there and gripes and complains and judges, then you know you're ready for the kingdom of God. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.